Welcome back, I'm That Chemist, and today we have another Patreon exclusive compilation. Thank you for your continued support of the channel, and let's get started. Inhaling hydrogen chloride gas hits like a truck. I once added sulfuric acid to a solution of hydrochloric acid, either because the hydrochloric acid was crappy and had other dissolved chlorides, or because of extra protonation provided by the sulfuric acid of chloride ions, or most likely because of the heat released upon acid addition. Tons of hydrochloric acid gas was produced. For some reason though, this didn't hit me immediately, and for a split second, I really thought some HCl solution was magically making gas and being relatively young, ADHD, and a dumbass. Well, let's just say I let the intrusive thoughts win. Upon the gentlest of sniffs, I felt like I was just hit in the face with an axe. Really, like smelling salts on steroids, but instead of moderately alkali ammonia, it was extremely acidic hydrogen chloride. When it hit, it was like I blacked out for a split second. Fortunately, I wasn't a complete dumbass and didn't deeply inhale the gas or anything, knowing that just a sufficiently concentrated HCl solution is already horribly pungent. This is true, it absolutely is. Regardless, it was terrible and a major shock to the system. Not a great high, guys. If you ever do need to generate hydrogen chloride, if you're ever doing chemistry lab work, the easiest way to generate anhydrous hydrogen chloride is to dropwise add concentrated sulfuric acid onto sodium chloride and then dry the resulting HCl through a bubbler full of concentrated sulfuric acid. This will fully dehydrate out any of the water and anhydrous HCl gas will pass through the other side. Now, anhydrous HCl gas is really dangerous because guess what? It doesn't have any water and we have a lot of water. So that's gonna go and protonate any mucous membrane, anything with any bit of water that it can find. And that's gonna make you have a real bad time. A stunt that almost got me thrown out of school. We had a neutron lab, Triga MK3 training reactor and we're measuring activation of indium foils in a thermal neutron beam. We had a clown in our class that didn't like to wear his modestly heavy dosimeter. This is a thing that measures the radioactive dose. He was forever laying it out on the table. I thought I would make a point and picked it up off the table and placed it inside of a lead brick of cesium sources. If you're wondering about this, they store stuff inside of a lead brick to just prevent radiation from getting out. I don't know if lead blocks everything, but it definitely reduces the intensity of the really bad ones. Before end of class, I put it back. So we're in line, turning them over to safety, and Mr. Clown does so. Safety guy reads it and turns white. Things started to escalate rapidly, so I fessed up. Got chewed out by the professor, too. Two whole weeks later, called to come into the dean's office. Got reamed out, heavily. Threatened with expulsion. Oops. Nobody seemed to care that Mr. Clown wasn't wearing the thing down in the pit with the neutron beams. Oh well, I promised to be on my best behavior, and was. This was in 1968. So if you didn't pick up what happened here, because he put the dosimeter inside the lead-lined container with all the cesium sources, that dosimeter picked up a really high reading, and when the guy handed it back to the teacher, the teacher freaked out because he thought that that kid was super radioactive. So, uh, yeah, that that's pretty scary. Now, I'm not sure if they're kids here or in university, but let's be honest, if you're in university, you're still a kid. Fun story from back in my high school days. Now, my school was always notoriously low on funding, and the building was pretty much falling apart. There was literally birds living in holes that they had dug into the ancient isolation in the building's walls. The city had plans to build an entirely new building somewhere else, but that had been in development hell for at least a decade now. One warm summer's day, one of our chem teachers was busy in the chem storage room preparing a series of experiments for a lesson later that day, when she accidentally bumped into one of the decades-old storage shelves, causing the crappy old thing to disassemble. Oh no! Now luckily, the shelf was mostly empty, except for four fresh new 1-liter bottles, what was in these fresh new bottles that had just arrived? Basically the month prior, you may ask? Well, hydrochloric acid, sulfuric acid, formic acid, and phosphoric acid, of course. The bottles shattered, spilling their contents all over the floor into a large puddle of rather angry liquid just chilling there. Another teacher came in to try and help her with the cleanup, when the puddle of spicy juice TM began to foam and started gassing off some ridiculously bad smell. This was about the time that I would assume that they began hearing boss music. Da, 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 da. I mean, you know that the final boss music definitely will play as soon as the dean of the department comes into the lab, that's for sure. As it turned out, because it was locked most of the time, the chem storage room didn't get cleaned out all too often, and there were all kinds of funny dirt and dust and god knows what on the floor, so the spicy puddle found itself with traces of all kinds of fun things to react with, including the floor itself. It still has a nice big stain from where the funny puddle sat. Because the teachers weren't quite sure exactly what was happening, they got the hell out of there and locked down that part of the building, with these big heavy fire stopper doors we had everywhere throughout the school. But that didn't stop the smell. By the time we went home that day, the whole school, despite open windows and running ventilation, was gassed up with this unbearable, sickening, half-chemical, half-organic miasma. It was pretty cool for little old me to see clean-up people with hazmat suits running around the schoolyard. 
Apparently nothing toxic was produced, and the teachers were fine after spending the night at the hospital for observation, just in case. But damn, that stench was just something else. The school is using the same shelves to this day. They insist they'll start on the new building soon. Trust me for real this time, 100%. It'll happen, I know it. It is possible that chemicals can be extremely foul smelling. You haven't smelled anything real bad till you've worked in a chemistry lab, for sure. Obligatory not a chemist, but my brother and I did some really stupid crap growing up. I was, admittedly, the quiet one, but I certainly had my moments, like when I wanted to show him something cool that I just learned in chemistry class. The reaction of hydrochloric acid with metals. Some of you probably see where this is going. In high school, we did this reaction with 4 molar HCl and strips of zinc metal cut from a sheet. I couldn't get zinc as far as I knew, but I figured it would work with aluminum foil, and a particular brand of toilet bowl cleaner was 20% HCl, which is actually a lot stronger than what we used in the lab. 20% HCl is almost concentrated HCl, so this is very strong. It was cheap too, one dollar for a 32 ounce bottle of this stuff, and of course, the dollar store let me buy it without so much as asking why a teenager would be buying HCl. I guess they didn't know how potentially dangerous it could be? Anyway, my mistake was my decision to spice up the demo by putting these reactants not in an open jar or something, but in a 20 ounce bottle so I could seal it. I loaded up the bottle, sealed it, and tossed it under the back porch. Oh no. Then, my brother and I waited behind the air conditioning unit, which was only about 10 feet away from what was about to become a bottle bomb. The scary thing about this violently exothermic reaction is that it doesn't do anything for a while, probably because of the coating on the foil, but when it does go, it goes fast. This is why, after a few minutes, I honestly thought I had messed up and it wasn't going to do anything. I apologized to my brother for the disappointment and stood up to collect the failed experiment immediately before BOOM. Or should I say, FOOMP. I have no idea how neither of us permanently lost our hearing that day, or our eyesight. It's not like we were wearing PPE of any kind when a bottle of acid exploded so close to us. I later found out that my neighbor had heard the blast from inside her basement closet on the other side of her house across the street. I definitely believed her, as it was easily the loudest noise I've ever heard. Seriously, nothing else comes close. Suffice to say, this was fun, but I learned to respect chemistry from that. It's honestly terrifying what people will sell you at the store. There's been a pattern of behavior, at least in Canada recently, where more and more producers of these chemicals aren't even labeling what's inside the bottle. And that's something that causes great concern to me. Like every good chemist, I have a story of being chlorine gassed. Unlike most chemists, I am not a chemist, but an Arby's worker. The CEO of our franchise was set to visit in two days. They flaked, but a lesser higher up visited instead. So our GM decided we needed to deep clean the entire restaurant. This was everything from cleaning the mold off of our walls to scrubbing the parking lot with sanitizing solution. After a while of cleaning, I had no customers up front, so she had me clean the drink machine and the area behind it. Behind the drink machine, a line had developed a leak a few months back, so there's always a ton of sticky drink syrup behind it. Our manager wanted it gone. It's important to know that this area was enclosed on five out of the six sides. She had multiple people try to clean it, apparently with a variety of chemicals, when in reality, it just needed to be scraped off. However, I had the longest arms there and could barely reach the puddle's edge. I crawled up to the crack left by the drink machine in the wall and sprayed some chlorinated cleaner in there. After about 30 seconds of scrubbing, my eyes started burning. I got out of the space and started coughing. This cleared out after a few seconds, but I decided to lie and tell my manager I had cleaned up all of the puddle I could reach. A few hours later, my eyes started burning again, a little less than previously, and I had a pretty bad cough for the rest of the day. Additionally, I had a really sore throat, felt like strep for a few days. I don't know if a few chemicals were unintentionally mixed or if the chlorinated cleaner was just a little volatile, but I've always found an excuse to avoid cleaning behind the drink machine since that time. Well, I know chemicals were mixed, but I don't know if mixing caused that or if it was just volatile. Honestly, if they mixed a chlorinated cleaner like bleach with almost anything, it probably made something bad because chlorine reacts with almost everything. So yeah, they probably made chlorine gas or nitrogen trichloride or hydrogen chloride acid gas and just just bad stories. Don't don't do that. Don't mix chlorine with stuff, please. Nuclear materials scientist. As a postdoc, I was tasked with decommissioning a metallographic prep lab to move to a new lab in a new building. Besides finding kilos of poorly labeled reactor steel samples and discovering the radioactive waste pipe at the back of the lab, the main thing involved was a fridge full of electrolytes for electropolishing slash etching samples for EM. This fridge contained approximately 10 liter bottles of electrolytes, most of which were perchloric acid in methanol ethanol, and also a perchloric and acetic acid mixture. We have a chemical specialist who is involved in the decommissioning process who I had never met and barely responded to our emails. Not being chemists, we organized for her to dispose of the contents of the fridge before the move deadline in which an external company was coming to take everything to the new campus. Day of the deadline, she hadn't disposed of the chemicals, and I was receiving emails from the health and safety head demanding that I sign off on the decommissioning certificate. I said that I can't reasonably sign off as we have basically a fridge shaped bomb of super acid sat in the corner and he said, well, the specialist is aware, just sign it. 
I started filling out the sheet and got to the line that said no acids are stored in this lab. I emailed him again, asking if he's super extra sure, and he sent a very blunt email saying back, just send me the form. Two weeks later, I'm away on leave and I get a call from a PhD student. The fridge had shown up to our new lab with the electrolytes still inside. The moving guys had just transported it halfway across the city, through the new building, and up to the top floor, knowing nothing about the danger of what they were carting around. Also, when I arrived, the day after the chemical specialist had actually cleared it out, I opened the fridge to look inside and my fingers immediately smelled like acetic acid, meaning that the perchloric slash acetic acid had contaminated the handle of the fridge in the process. Honestly, I think anytime you have a volatile chemical stored inside of a fridge, you're going to be condensing it on every surface. I worked in one lab that had a freezer with xenon difluoride in it, and that freezer always smelled like xenon difluoride for like forever. There's no way to get rid of the smell. And vinegar is one of those smells that lingers very strongly. So I don't necessarily think it's a guarantee that it's spilled. But honestly, based on what I've heard in this story so far, I wouldn't be too surprised either. The main concern with perchloric acid is you can form metal perchlorates, which are explosive. And so if they're just sloshing around this, it could be hitting metal. If it's spilled, it could be an issue. It's not like they're carrying around a thing full of TNT, but it is like a little bit concerning. The main concern is perchloric acid gets fairly concentrated, but yeah, this is still definitely a bad chain of command, and there's a lot of people with issues here. Early on in my amateur chemistry fun, while I was super reckless and inexperienced, I decided to attempt to generate singlet oxygen using over-the-counter bleach and hydrogen peroxide. If you haven't heard of this before, you might be aware that different chemicals can be formed as a consequence of chemical reactions, but that doesn't mean that the chemical is always generated in its ground state. And so in this instance, when you combine hydrogen peroxide and bleach, you actually have excited oxygen. And this is like oxygen the day it gets out of jail. It's ready to commit some crime. The moment oxygen gets out of the straitjacket and it's ready to kill again. However, what I was trying to dissolve needed acidic conditions to become soluble, so I was using malic acid for that. Everything was going great so far with my testing, and I have made the very bad habit of smelling my chem as I go along to try and potentially gauge a reaction that was happening. Anyway, this eventually led to me adding about 5 milliliters of bleach to probably half a gram of malic acid with some water. I saw the reaction bubble pretty nicely and some fumes coming off. It must be working, I thought innocently. I leaned in to take a sniff and took a deep breath through the nose. The inhale was fine, a little salty, but when I went to exhale, my lungs sort of clenched and I had to forcibly exhale through my mouth, cue me coughing violently and gasping for air for about 5 to 10 minutes. I used my asthma inhaler and when I felt a little bit better, I started googling, that's how inexperienced I was, what I may have done to myself. I mean, honestly, if you don't know what happened, Googling is probably your best shot, unless you have someone more experienced, but when crap is hitting the fan, everybody freaks out. You already know, yep, chlorine gas. I not only generated a generous helping of chlorine gas, but I also immediately inhaled a large breath as the reaction was taking place. I spent the next six hours coughing, took a break from chem to reflect, and woke up the next morning fine. I absolutely understand why chlorine was used in chemical warfare now. I've come far in years since, but it was a very valuable lesson for me either way, and I'll never smell chemistry intentionally again. I'm not sure if it was chlorine that they made or hypochlorous acid, but regardless, mixing bleach with acids and smelling it is a bad idea. Don't, don't do that. My first internship at the end of high school was in the lab of a chemical plant that produces sulfuric and hydrochloric acid of various concentrations and purity. The lab technician that taught me the analysis was really clumsy, clearly didn't care about his job, and didn't really care about safety. He never wore gloves or glasses even when handling fuming sulfuric acid, and often spilled it on his hands and had to rush to the sink almost daily to wash it before getting burned. One of the analyses that he had to teach me was checking for the presence of chlorides in the ultra-pure sulfuric acid. To do so, he filled a 250 volumetric flask with about 100 milliliters of water, then he poured on top of it 50 milliliters of 98% sulfuric acid sample. This is a terrible idea. This is do what you oughta, add acid to water, but not like this. Then the method required to neutralize it, slowly pouring 50 milliliters of sodium hydroxide solution while mixing and eventually giving it time to cool down. The problem was he didn't mix the solutions, not after adding the sulfuric acid and not while quickly and carelessly adding the NaOH. I also want to highlight here that this is a really exothermic reaction done in a volumetric flask. This is F tier. This, this is going to get you failed in chemistry class. You do not do exothermic reactions in volumetric glassware. Bad. This is bad. Don't do this. The two solutions immediately started boiling, creating a geyser of corrosive stuff that hit the ceiling and rained down on him. I was quick enough to step back and didn't get hit, and for some sort of magic, the flask didn't explode and he just washed and changed clothes and was fine with no injury. Yeah, this is absolutely a work of magic. The worrying thing was that from that day on, I noticed that the ceiling of the lab was covered in stains from previous accidents, so that wasn't even his first eruption episode. This guy sounds like a guy I would not want to work with. Uh, I would work in a different lab, and 
I would just try and work in an area of the lab that doesn't have any stains on it yet, but maybe this is survivorship bias. Maybe, maybe the solution would spray onto the wall instead. Who knows? That chemist. Gen X is readily decarboxylated. Me, on my way to decarboxylate my mom. So I want to thank all of you once again for your magnificent support. I really appreciate your continued support of the channel. At this point in time, I think I'm going to be defending my PhD in the fall. So I won't be posting quite as much as I was in the past year or so. I will still be uploading. I'll hopefully be doing around one tier list a month still. But if you don't see as many uploads as previously, that's why. Thanks for watching, and I hope you have a great day.